All right. We're uh, continuing on in the book of Ecclesiastes. Let me uh, get myself straight here and then uh, we'll get started. All right. We'll do this screen share. Okay, we're cooking with gas. All right, so we are in uh, the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, I'm going to come back to that particular slide. All right, uh, as many of you know, uh, I teach, uh, I've been teaching this class out at uh, Cornerstone. Uh, on Wednesday evenings. And uh, I, I tell them, just like I, I've told you guys, we're, we're not going to cover every verse in Ecclesiastes. You know, we, we are trying to do it in six weeks. So we're not going to cover every verse. But if there's a verse that you have a question about, uh, I would encourage you to submit it and, and then I can make sure I, I answer it. So there was a guy out at Cornerstone and he uh, submitted a question that he had about something in the book of Ecclesiastes. And, and this was the verse that he submitted, uh, Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 7 and verse 28. And it says this, though I have searched repeatedly, I have not found what I was looking for. Only one out of a thousand men is virtuous, but not one woman. And so uh, he had a question. I think he was trying to set me up <laughs> by answering, by asking this question. Uh, uh, but here we see that Solomon said that he had searched repeatedly. And I think this is uh, the Living Bible translation. Uh, but it kind of, you know, the same ring is found in the King James, too. Uh, that I haven't found what I was looking for. He said, I only, uh, out of a thousand men, he only found one, and then he didn't find one virtuous woman. So uh, if you look at some people who are commentating on this verse, uh, they said that uh, this verse is misogynistic and it belittles women. Uh, so, you know, and, and, you know, why is that in the Bible? Uh, so, you know, that's a good question. Let me remind you that Solomon is talking from his personal experience. He's not saying that there are no virtuous women. So, you know, we got to start out with that foundation. He's not saying that there are no virtuous women. He's merely stating his personal experience. And so, Quite possibly, uh, and, and, and you notice what else he said. He said he only found uh, one out of a thousand men who was virtuous. So evidently, uh, in Solomon's encounters, you know, he must have ran into a lot of people who were shady. And so he's talking from his experience, uh, because if we, we were to go back during his day, you know, we could probably find many godly women and many godly men. Now, remember, uh, Solomon, I believe, uh, wrote uh, Song of Solomon when he was young. He wrote Proverbs uh, during his middle, middle age. And I believe Ecclesiastes is the reflection of a man who has lived his life, an older man who has. Now, now keep in mind, you know, uh, Solomon. Uh, had a lot of relationships. It says that he has 700 wives and 300 uh, concubines. Uh, so, you know, maybe in his experience with uh, those individuals, you know, there were people that, you know, were out to get over. You know, I, I, I think of uh, that song by Harold Melvin in the Blue, uh, Blue Notes. And uh, it talked about uh, when they had a bunch of money, right? They had a lot of friends. 
And uh, but when they lost their money, their friends, you know, disappeared. And so maybe this was a little bit of Solomon's experience. Uh, you know, there were people who uh, hooked up with him because of his wealth. And uh, but, you know, again, uh, according to the song with uh, uh, Harold Melvin in the Blue Notes, uh, Teddy Pendergrass, you know, where are all my friends? Right. That he had a bunch of friends when he had money. But the minute that he was broke, you know, his friends left. And, and so, you know, maybe that was Solomon's experience. Maybe he experienced people who jumped on his uh, boat and they went along for the ride. And uh, he eventually uh, uh, scoped them out and saw, you know, what their motives were. So, again, uh, and, I, <laughs> and like I said, I believe the guy set me up when he... Uh, when he, when he asked me uh, this question. Uh, again, you know, the bottom line is that Solomon is not saying there are no virtuous women. Uh, he was just stating his personal experience. You know, no, notice what he said in the verse, though I have searched repeatedly. So, you know, he said in his search that this was his uh, findings and this was his experience. So again, uh, there may be questions like this <laughs> that you, uh, uh, see in the book of Ecclesiastes, and, you know, I would encourage you to uh, let me know. You know, you can uh, send them in to uh, Naomi. Uh, you can email me at pwrglaze at aol.com. So if you have a question about uh, something in Ecclesiastes that we might not cover, uh, feel free to uh, contact me and let me know. All right, so back to the book of Ecclesiastes. And we see here, uh, and uh, we weren't able to get the notes out to you today, uh, so uh, hopefully uh, we can get them to you tomorrow. Uh, but in the book of Ecclesiastes, we see that there are three perspectives. There's the fatalistic perspective, and we're going to talk about that this afternoon a little bit. Uh, there's a humanistic perspective, and then there's the theistic perspective. Uh, the humanistic and fatalistic perspective mainly focuses on life under the sun. 29 times in the book of Ecclesiastes, Solomon uses the phrase under the sun. And so if you uh, look at it from a fatalistic where, you know, there's nothing to be gained in this life, you know, what will be will be. Uh, if you look at it from the fatalistic or humanistic uh, where the author is giving his viewpoint, those are all perspectives from under the sun. And so what uh, Solomon is trying to get us to do is to look above the sun, to focus above the sun. And when we do that, uh, we can enter into a relationship with God. All right, so today uh, we're gonna talk about greed. Uh, many of you, and uh, you know, uh, I've titled this series, Songs in the Key of Life, right? So uh, there was a song in the 70s, uh, For the Love of Money. Uh, it was written by Kenneth Gamble, Leon Huff, and Anthony Jackson. Uh, it was made famous by the OJs in 1973. Now, surprisingly, this song, you might not know this. So Pastor Glaze is going, see, that's why it, it pays to join us for Bible study because you learn little tidbits that you might not get otherwise, all right? This song, For the Love of Money, by the OJs, actually is based on scripture. You didn't know that, did you? It's based on 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 10, where it says, the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows this song is a perfect description of what a person who is filled with greed will do for money in the song it talks about a person who would steal from their mother my 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 a person who would rob their own brother wow a person who will lie, cheat, hurt, 
beat others, and sell their bodies for money. Greed. And so the passage that we're going to look at today, Solomon talks about greed. Now, somebody might say, well, Pastor Glaze, that's not necessarily my problem. Well, I think that if we're not careful, greed can sneak into all of our lives. And we will see that as we examine the scripture this afternoon. Chuck Swindoll says that greed, well, no, this is not Chuck Swindoll. This is unknown. I got a couple quotes by Chuck Swindoll. This is not one. Uh, greed is not defined by what something costs. It is measured by what it costs you. And if you think about what does greed cost you? Sleepless nights, right? Health problems, relationship problems. Greed costs. And so we need to realize that greed is not defined by what something costs. It's measured by what it costs you. People were asked, what would you do for $10 million? Two thirds of Americans poll would agree to at least one, some to several of the following, would abandon their family of the, of the survey that they took, 25%, would abandon their church, 25%. This is deep right here. Would become prostitutes for a week or more, 23%. Would give up their American citizenship, 16% would leave their spouses, 16%, would withhold testimony and let a murderer go free, 10%. Now look at this, would kill a stranger. And you know, this, this is not far-fetched or this is not hard to believe because people have no problem these days killing people, right? Just I mean, just look at all the killings that's taking place, mass killings, and not only that, but individual killings. 3% would put their children up for adoption. Greed. And God knows that greed is a problem. God knows it. When you look at the Bible, it addresses money more than any other topic except the kingdom of God. Of the 30 parables that Jesus told, 16 of them dealt with money. There are 500 verses on prayer, 500 verses on faith, but over 2,000 verses on money. You think that God doesn't know that greed is a problem? What is greed? Greed is a selfish and excessive desire for more of something than is actually needed and allowing oneself to be controlled by that desire. So it's not only a desire, but that person allows themselves to be controlled by that desire. What are the objects of greed? Money, food, possessions, people of the opposite sex, or maybe even the same sex, right? That uh, these are objects of a person's greed. What are the causes? of greed, dread, desire, and delight. Dread, I fear that I might lose everything, so I better get all I can, right? People that have fear that they're gonna lose, so they just try to get more and more. Desire, people have a craving to have more than they actually need. But this probably is the biggest one, this third one, and that is delight. I want to experience the delights of pleasure and more things give me more pleasure. Wow. The causes of greed, dread, desire, and delight. Greed knows no parameters. Jeremiah said, from the least to the greatest, all are greedy for gain. Prophets and priests alike, all practice deceit. No parameters. The prosperous and the poor, the potentate and the pauper, 
the politician and the people, the performer and the patron, the prudent and the pervert. They all are open and susceptible to greed. Chuck Swindoll, he said, greed and materialism have no built-in safeguards or satisfying limits. Notice that again. They have no built-in safeguards, nothing to bring you in check. And they have no satisfying limits. That greed is, uh, has no boundaries. It, it just grows and grows and grows. And there's no limit on greed. As we look at Ecclesiastes, we're going to begin in Ecclesiastes. So if you have your Bibles, I know you don't have the notes, but if you have your Bibles, or maybe you got your Bible on your smartphone, or maybe you got your Bible on your tablet. Uh, so you can pull it out. Uh, maybe you have a uh, hard copy edition of the Bible. I, I tell you what, I still uh, like, I mean, I, I use uh, scriptures. I put scriptures up on the screen and I'll do all that. But saints, I'm gonna be honest with you. I still like my hard copy Bible. I still, when I'm, when I'm up in the pulpit, uh, and again, when I'm preaching, I might put the verses up on the screen, but I got my Bible right there so that uh, if I, you know, if I need to refer to it, which I do on many occasions, I'm, a scripture might pop into my mind. And, uh, you know, I, I don't have time to be fiddling around with a uh, computer, you know, that might, I got to wait for it to come on, right? I got to uh, touch this. And sometimes, you know, I was preaching a sermon one time and uh, I said, well, let me, let me do it off my phone. I was going to preach off my phone. And I got up there and started preaching and didn't my phone go off, right? Turned off. And I was trying to up there messing around with it. So I said, you know what? That's why I'm going to keep that hard copy. I'm going I'm to use my, I bring my Bible. So I got my Bible right in front of me. Uh, so whatever. Now, somebody will say, why did Pastor Glaze go into that discourse? Because I was trying to give you time that if you needed to go get you. <laughs> If you needed to go get your Bible, or maybe you needed to pull this up on your on your smartphone or your tablet. So I was trying to give you time to be able to do that. Okay, so first of all, we see that there is greed in government, right? Greed in government. Uh, I believe it was uh, Ronald Reagan. And again, I'm not a political uh, guy. You know, I don't uh, express views as to who you should vote for. You know, I believe that's between you and God. Uh, so I, I usually try to stay away from a, a lot of, you know, uh, political figures. Uh, but this is not a negative thing. Uh, Ronald Reagan, uh, I believe he was the one that said, whenever somebody says, uh, I'm from the government and I'm here to, here to help, then you need to beware. <laughs> you need to beware. And so Solomon talks about greed in the government. He says in chapter five and verse eight, he said, moreover, the profit of the earth is for all. The king himself is served by the field. Okay. Well, well let, you know, I, I read verse nine. Let me go back. Uh, if thou seest the oppression of the poor, right? The, the poor being oppressed and the violent perverting of justice and righteousness in a province, right? So if you see the government, you know, again, now Solomon was uh, talking about kings because that's what they had back in his day. But just think about some of the governments that were there in the Bible times, right? You think about Nebuchadnezzar, his government, and the things that he did. You think about Pharaoh in his government, in the things that he did. You think about uh, some of the other governments that were around during Solomon's time. And he says here that what, what did those governments do? That they oppressed the poor and they perverted justice. He said, if you see that, he said, don't marvel at that matter. Look at this. For he that is higher than the highest regardeth, and there are higher than they. So who, who are these higher? 
the government, right? Who who is the highest? Now he's not talking about God here. Okay, so if he was talking about God, then I, I could see something different. Uh, because I always say, ain't no high like the most high, right? Uh El Elyon, God the most high God. But Solomon is not talking about here. He's talking about hierarchies. He's talking about governments. And he says, moreover, uh, the profit of the earth is for all. And so what, what Solomon is saying here is that, you know, everyone should benefit by the things that God has put here on this earth. Uh, now, again, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not promoting any uh, brand of government, uh, capitalism, socialism, or anything like that. So I, you know, just, so don't, don't, don't connect that with me, right? All I'm saying is what Solomon is saying here. He's saying that the higher ups, you know, they pervert justice. They take advantage of the poor. And why do they do that? because of control and because of greed, right? And Solomon says in verse nine, he said, hey, look, there's enough on this earth for all of us, right? So why is it that certain people monopolize and allow other people because of injustice? Now, again, I'm trying not to be political here because I know that this, this could turn real political. Why is it that governments, and I'm not even gonna talk about our government, you know, let's just look at governments around the world and just look how they try to control and how that people that are in the higher up positions, that they have all the wealth, they have all the cash, right? And why is that? Because there's an element of greed there. And so Solomon starts out by talking about greed in the government. And you know, when you think about it, even here in America, and again, I'm not gonna broad brush every politician. I'm not gonna do that because I don't think that every politician is greedy. But when you look at how, how do you even get to run for a political office, for the most, especially, you know, higher up offices, you got to have some cash, man. You know, you, you got to have some cash to, to, to get started. You got to have somebody behind you, right? And, and so uh, some people let that get out of control. And, and so Solomon starts out by talking about greed in the government. He said, now notice the things that he, he says, these are things that he observed under the sun. He saw this under the sun, all right? Uh, so... We should not be surprised when we see high-ranking officials either exploiting the less exploiting the less fortunate for slave labor or take from the ones under their rule without giving it a second thought. Again, Solomon says there's enough goodness for everyone. Yet at the top, there are those who are consumed by greed. We saw, we see greed and humanity. So he not only talks about uh, greed in the government, but now he talks about greed in humanity. Notice what he says here. The greedy are never satisfied in verse 10. He that loves silver shall not be satisfied with silver. Silver was a metaphor for money. And he says, those who love silver, those who love money will never be satisfied with money. And he goes on to say in verse 10, uh, and he that loveth abundance with increase, this is, this is vanity, that those who love abundance, who, who love to, uh, as I always say, uh, get all they can, can all they get, and then sit on the can right? Those who love abundance, he said, this is vanity. This is vanity. Now, I'm going to tell y'all something. And uh, I've said this before, so you probably heard me say this before. So don't take this the wrong way. Don't take this the wrong way. Uh, I, I don't love money. I don't love money. But I love my money, right? 
And what do I mean by that? I, I, I love my money enough that I don't want to do anything foolish with it. I love my money enough that I want to give God his portion. I love my money enough that I want to be responsible in paying my bills. I love my money enough that I want to be generous and bless others, right? So I don't love money, but I love my money. And Solomon says here that there are those who love money. They love, look, notice what he says. He that loves money <laughs> shall never be satisfied, right? And he that loves increase, abundance, uh, he said, this is vanity. The next thing he says about greed and humanity is this. Verse 11, riches increase from greed brings on additional problems. So if you got your Bibles, verse 11, when goods increase, they are increased who eat them. What good is there to the owners thereof, saving the beholding of them with their eyes? And so he says here, when a person gets more, he attracts <laughs> more people around him, right? Uh, whether they be in the form of servants or even people who want to leech off of this individual. And so when the goods increase, not only do the people around you increase, but notice this. That people buy bigger and more expensive toys. You know, there was a uh, car that uh, had the license plate or the, the plate on it that said, he who uh, dies with the most toys wins. And it was uh, it was one of these fancy sports cars, right? I guess he was trying to make people jealous. And it says, he who dies with the most toys wins. And then somebody must have came alongside and, and put up a sign that said, yeah, but he still dies right? But he still dies. So Solomon said that increased riches brings on additional problems. And, and so uh, Solomon talks about, notice uh, what he says here. Uh, he says, when goods, I mean, verse 11, when goods increase, they are increased who eat them. And what good is it to the owners thereof? saving the beholding of them with their eyes. See, and, and so Solomon is saying that uh, sometimes people are not even satisfied with what they have because they're, they're out trying to make the next buck. And so they don't even enjoy the toys that they have. They're just eye candy, just something for them to look at because they're consumed with the next buck and where they're going to get the next buck from. Solomon is getting deep, right? In verse 12, Solomon said, greed, greed is the cause for many sleepless nights. Greed is the cause for many sleepless nights. Notice what he says in verse 12. The sleep of a laboring man is sweet, whether he eats little or much, but the abundance of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. Man, when Solomon is saying, when somebody goes out and, and works hard, uh, uh, is responsible with their money, right? They can go to bed and get a good night's sleep. He said, but the abundance of the greedy will not suffer them to sleep. This person doesn't rest well. Why? Because he or she is worried about how they can hold on to what they got and how they can get more, right? So they stay up at night, scheming and conniving, trying to hold on to what they got and trying to see how they can get more. Verses 13 and 14, uh, the greedy person, this will lead to their own personal harm. This will lead to their own personal hurt. Notice what he says in 13 and 14. 
for there is a great evil which I have seen. Where, oh my goodness, where? Now, where did you see this at, Solomon? Where did you see it? Y'all know what he's going to say. 29 times he said this in the book of Ecclesiastes. There's a great evil that I have seen under the sun, namely riches kept for the owners thereof to their hurt. Riches that were kept, that were accumulated, that were acquired to the owner's hurt. But those riches perish by evil travail, and he begetteth a son, and there is nothing in his hand. And so riches, Solomon says, are kept for the owner's hurt. I had a, let me see if I can find it. Um, I had an illustration here that I, that I wanted to share with you. Okay. All right. Well, let me see if I can remember the illustration. Uh, it was about a lady who worked in a store and uh, she ended up uh, taking somebody's credit card and she stole their information. And, you know, she used the, the credit card in the store to buy uh, a bunch of stuff. And they would have never caught her. You know how they caught her? <laughs> See, this is crazy, man, right? Is that she wanted to get her employee discount. <laughs> Look, you, you already ripped somebody off of their credit card and you're getting something because you're greedy. You're getting it for free. <laughs> and now you want your employee discount. My friend, that's the epitome of greed, right? That's the epitome of greed. But that's the human nature, right? That's the human nature that if, if, if we don't have God in our lives, if we don't have a sense of uh, morality, if we don't have a sense of decency, the, 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 the nature of the flesh is to, is to be greedy. And it ends up harming us. Notice again, Solomon said he saw a great evil under the sun and that was riches kept for the owner's hurt. Riches that the owners kept and they were to their own hurt. And then finally, Solomon says that the greedy person will leave it all behind. The greedy person will leave it all behind. In Ecclesiastes 5, 15 through 17, uh, as he came forth from his mother's womb, naked shall he return to go as he came, the greedy person, right? The greedy person. And the greedy person shall take nothing of his labor, which he may carry away in his hand. And this is also a great evil, that in all points as he came, so shall he go. The same way you came in this world is the same way you go out. No matter how good your family dresses you up, before they tuck you away, the fact is you leaving out of here the same way that you came in to this world. And he says that, and what profit have he that hath labored for the wind? You know, all that you work for, you're gonna leave it all behind. All his days also he eateth in darkness and have much sorrow and wrath with sickness. And so uh, Solomon says here that the greedy person will leave it all behind. So uh, in, in this chapter, uh, Solomon talked about greed in the government and he talked about greed in humanity. See, I like this illustration here of this uh, monkey. Uh, He's grabbing a banana. He put his hand down in the jar, grabbed the banana. Now he can't get his hand out. Now, how can he get his hand out? He can get his hand out. All he got to do is drop the banana and he can pull his hand out. But what's keeping his hand in the jar? 
with it grafts tight to the banana. Greed. Greed is, is keeping him holding on to the banana. So let's look at life under the, not S-U-N, but let's look at life under the S-O-N. Life under the S-O-N. The first thing that Solomon says in verse 18 is that we should be content. We should be content. Behold, that which I have seen, it is good and fitting for one to eat and drink. My, 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 listen to this. And enjoy the good of his labor that he taketh under the sun all the days of his life, which God giveth him for his portion. Be content. Now, again, I'm not saying that you shouldn't buy anything new. I'm not saying that you should buy anything better. If God blesses you to be able to do that, you know what I say? Go ahead with your bad self. Go ahead with your bad self. But even at that, be content. Don't, don't have this desire to want to get more, more, more. Lay up more, more, more. Don't be like the rich fool who said, I'm going to tear down my barns and build bigger barns. Don't be like him. You know, if God blesses you to get something better, if God blesses you to get something bigger, then, hey, nothing wrong with that. But check your heart. Check your spirit. Ask yourself, do I have a spirit of greed? Am I, am I desiring this because I have a spirit of greed? So be content. The next thing Solomon said, trust God. Trust, trust God. Notice, it says that God is the one who gives you these things. God is the one. When, when you realize that the things that you have come from the hand of the Lord, this should lead you to trust God more. The one who trusts God, oh, let, listen to this now. You're going to get the notes tomorrow. And when you get the notes tomorrow, you're going to read this. <laughs> you can't focus on God and focus on greed at the same time. Can't do it. Can't do it. If we focus on God, we know that God is able to take care of all of our needs. The next thing, be generous. Be generous. Verse 19, every man also to whom God gives riches and wealth and hath given him power to eat thereof and to take his portion and to rejoice in his labor. Notice, this is a gift from God. This is a gift from God. That when you think about this verse, we see, first of all, God gives you your riches. That's contentment. God enables you to partake in the fruit of your riches. That's enjoyment. And then God gives you the gift. That's a blessing. And so I believe that God would have us to have open hands. Somebody said that God will get it to you if God can get it through you. The problem is a lot of times when it gets in our hands, we tighten up, right? Solomon says that in order to overcome greed, that you have to open up your hands and be generous. And then focus on the end result. He says in verse 20, for the greedy person shall not be remembered the days of his life because God answers him in the joy of the heart. The one whose heart is centered on greed will have many memories filled with anxiety, heartache, and discontentment. But the one who has a right spirit will have memories of joyful days in the presence of the Lord. 
focus on the end result. That greed causes us to have a lot of memories filled with anxiety, heartache, and discontent. But when our spirit is right, we will have memories of joyful days in the presence of the Lord. Life under the sun. All right, let me move to our next topic. And I have about 15 minutes to cover this next topic. And the next topic, we're going to talk about this song. Y'all remember this song? Maybe some of the younger people might not. But us older people, we remember this song by Doris Day. Uh, K. Sarah, Sarah. Whatever will be, will be. The question is asked in this song, you know, what will I be in childhood? What will I be in romance? What will I be in parenthood? And so in the song, they go through three stages of life. And each one, I ask my mother, what will I be? Will I be pretty? Will I be rich? This is what she said to me. K. Sarah, Sarah. Whatever will be, will be. And so as we move into Ecclesiastes chapter six, this is what Solomon is addressing. And when you look at this, this is what's known as fatalism, right? The belief that what will be, will be. All past, present, and future events have already been determined by fate, which is a supernatural force in the universe. Fatalism. Okay, sirrah, sirrah. Whatever will be, will be. That's, that's a fatalistic attitude that says you have no control over it. That whatever's going to happen to your life, whatever will be, will be. What are the elements of fatalism? Fatalism is a force, well, determinism, which is a force in the universe that determines what happens to you. Now, again, notice I didn't say God, that there's, you, you remember uh, the movie Star Wars? And in the movie Star Wars, what was one of the lines that came out of that? May the force be with you. May the force be with you. May whatever it is that determines what happens, may it only bring good things your way, which is another element of fatalism, which is luck. And luck is the source that brings good or bad things to a person. One thing you will never hear Pastor Glaze say, I will never tell anybody good luck. Because when you think about it, luck is a God. You can say, come on, Pastor Blaze, what are you talking about? Just think about people who gamble, right? Or, or roll the dice, right? While they're shaking them dice in their hands or they're trying to get their cards. What they would say, what did they say? Luck, be with me tonight. I pray that lady luck would be with me. People look at luck as a God, right? I only got one God. God is, luck is not my God, but this is a fatalistic attitude. Fatalism says whatever will be, will be. And hopefully the lucky cards will fall right for you. That if the, if, if the cards fall right, then you will have good in your life, right? If the cards fall bad, then you're going to have bad luck. You know, again, let me go back to Harold Melvin in the Blue Notes. You got bad luck. That's what you got. That's what you got. You got bad luck, bad luck. I'll get into a little groove here in my study, right? Bad luck. Come on, Harold. Come on, Harold Melvin. There's no such thing as luck. Come on, Teddy. Teddy Pendergrass. 
There's no such thing as luck. But these are elements of fatalism. It says that there's something out there that determines what, what's going to happen. And hopefully the lucky cards will fall your way and you'll have luck. See, when you look at fatalism versus faith, in fatalism, you're a victim. You can't, you can't, you have no control over what happens to you. And if we walk by faith, it says that we are more than conquerors who him, through him that loved us. In fatalism, it says that life just happens to me and I have no control of it. In faith, God has a purpose for my life. In fatalism, luck is the God. In faith, I should have put El Elyon, God, the most high God. And he works all things together for good. So Solomon is getting ready to enter into a discourse on fatalism. When, I like this right here, the response of the fatalist, you know, it was inevitable that a bird was going to do his business on this boy's head. That was inevitable. And so the little boy said, hey, I'm glad that this is over. Let's move on to the next thing, right? And so that's a fatalistic response. So in chapter six, verses one and two, uh, no matter how rich you are, que sera, sera, what will be, will be. Notice that Solomon said, there is an evil which I have seen under the sun and it is common among men. So again, in verse uh, one of chapter six, he's taken us under the sun. He said, I saw a man whom God has given riches, wealth, and honor so that he wanted nothing for all of his soul, yet God giveth him not the power to eat thereof, but a stranger eats it. This is vanity. This is an evil disease, right? People have riches, and they don't, they don't even have the ability to enjoy, to enjoy them. So sometimes no matter how, and again, if you, if you consume with greed, you're just trying to get more, right? And you're not even enjoying what you have. Uh, maybe some of you have heard of a person from the Greek mythology named Tantalus. He did something to displease the gods and they levied a cruel punishment upon him in the afterlife. You know what they did? They chained him in a lake and they allowed the waters to rise up to his chin. There was also a branch of luscious fruit above his head, right? <laughs> now watch this. Every time he tried to bend down and get a drink of water to satisfy his thirst. The waters would go down. When he reached up to grab the fruit, it moved beyond his reach. Have you ever heard of the word tantalize? This is where we get the word tantalize from, from this ancient Greek mythology, tantalus. Because every time when, when he was thirsty, that the water was right there and he would bend down to get a drink, the water would go down. When he was hungry and he would reach up to grab the fruit, the fruit would go up. And Solomon says that that's the way some people are. They got all these things around them, but they, they can't enjoy them. They can't enjoy them, right? So sometimes no matter how rich you are, Whatever will be, will be. Then Solomon says that an untimely birth is better than life. What will be, will be. Wow. Notice in verse three of chapter six, this guy had many children. He lived a long life but he didn't enjoy his life. He didn't eat, when, when he died, he didn't even have a decent burial. Look what Solomon says 
in verse three. If a man be get a hundred children and live many years so that the days of his years be many and his soul be not filled with good and also he has no burial, I say that an untimely birth is better than he is. A baby who dies at birth is better than this man, Solomon says. And then Solomon goes on to give four advantages. Now, this is deep, four advantages of an untimely birth. He said there are four things that make, a, make a, a, a baby that's stillborn, a baby that dies at birth. There are four advantages that this baby has that a person who lives their life, as this man did, that he doesn't have. First of all, he said that his life would have been short and obscure. That, you know, he would have uh, opened his eyes and then closed them right away in death. He said, secondly, he would not have seen the sun and all the frustrations of life. Just think about all the things that you go through, right? All Just if you had a chance to just sit back and think about all the negative things that you've experienced in your life, right? Solomon said, if you died at birth, you would have never experienced any of that, right? If this guy would have died at birth, he wouldn't, ex he wouldn't have experienced any of that. Solomon said in verse six, he would have missed the pains in life, right? The heartaches. You know, I know, you know, again, I appreciate your prayers, but I know my family is hurting right now. My daughter is hurting. My granddaughter is hurting. That my son is hurting. He was there when this young man got shot, right? Right in front of their house, right? Coming from my granddaughter's birthday party. My family is hurting. That's, that's pains that they are experiencing, right? Well, Solomon said, well, if they were stillborn, that they wouldn't have had to experience those pains. Now, again, you know, I'm not, I'm not agreeing with Solomon. So I, let, me, let me say that. I don't want anybody out there to think that Pat, well, Pastor Glaze is agreeing. No, I'm just saying Solomon is bringing up a point. He's bring, the point that he's bringing up is that if you died at birth, then you would have missed all the pains of life. And then he says in verse seven, that if you died at birth, you would have missed laboring for something that never satisfies, right? He, he, he says in uh, verse seven, all, all the labor of man is for his mouth and yet the appetite is not filled. He says that people labor for something and they are, their, their mouth is never filled. And you would have missed all that. So Solomon lists four advantages of an untimely birth. He says, in the end, no one has the advantage, right? What will be, will be. Que sera, sera, <laughs> right? Que sera, sera. What will be, will be. No one has the advantage. And uh, the next verse, I, I didn't put that up there, but uh, he said, uh, okay, verse eight. That should be verse eight, right? For what hath the wise man more than the fool? And what hath the poor than knoweth what to walk before the living? He says that there is no advantage in the end to the wise man and the poor man. They have no advantage over somebody that lived their life as an absolute fool. That the wise man and the poor man, both have no advantage over the fool that the fool they, they're all in the same boat right they're all so a guy lived his life foolishly and he made out just as well as a wise man and a poor man then solomon says what will be will be okay sarah sarah what will be will be he says in verse 10 that which has been named already it is known uh that is man, neither may he contend with him that uh, that's straight, okay? So he says, that which hath been is named already. What will be, will be. All things have been determined. And we cannot question the one who has put them in motion. Many words 
will not change things. What will be, will be. You can argue with the powers to be, and it will not change anything. Notice what he says in verse 11. Seeing there are many things that increase vanity, what is man the better? All right. So, oh, in, in bracket verse 10, uh, how can you contend with somebody that's mightier than you? How can you argue with somebody that's mightier than you? Many words don't change things. What will be, will be. So let me uh, run out, ran out of time here. Uh, let me stop there and just see if we have any questions on uh, greed or if we have any questions on fatalism. <laughs>